Three, two, one. I'm saying three, two, one. We're on. We're already fucking on. We're recording. Have you done this before? I have done this before, <laughs> mate. Like, fucking hell. I get slagged off already. Jesus Christ. I'm wondering how long it's going to be until you call me a crow, you fucking crow. <laughs> yeah, come on, you fucking sprout. <laughs> <laughs> However, you do get... You do... Christy Vincent, mate, it's fucking mega to have you in the studio. Fucking mega. When, uh, when, when, when Shay rocked up for the... When Shay rocked up for the podcast, I wasn't expecting you to come along. I didn't know you were either at the time. I didn't have a fucking clue. I'll be completely honest. didn't have a clue. And when you guys rocked up, we were talking before one, then we did the podcast with Shay, and then after the podcast, the three of us are sat here talking. I was like, fucking hell, this is mega. This is mega. Sat you listening to you and Shay shooting the shit with people. You know, you, you know what your experiences and background are. Like, real authentic people talking about unusual, unusual shit that you've done in your lives, you know. And, and I thought, let's get you in the studio. And by some miracle, you agreed, and here you are now. So, Christy, we are going to come on to the uh, the everything that came after your military career 100 percent come on to that however right now it's the 40th anniversary of the falkland islands 1982 um when we uh we smashed the arduis i've got argentine family by the way okay right i don't know why i whispered that she does <laughs> listen i got i got i say she you got a bunch but one of them listens anyway mate uh you so you were seven years old you remember a three para you can't have been in three para long maybe a year at most no no so where no. were you Months. at 17 years old when you got the call to get back to camp because you were going to be sailing somewhere down south or wherever you thought it was? So, uh, yeah, I joined uh, three para. Um, my first choice was one para because they were going to Ireland and uh, I'm like Mutley. I like fucking medals, do you know what I mean? And I thought, we could go to fucking Ireland, I'll get a medal and apparently that fast tracks you from being a, co a crow, do you know what I mean? Because you're going to be in, in, like, you know, on operations. So, but I was too young to go to one para. Um, so the platoon we passed out with four seven six platoon, um, we went to three para, uh, and it was Carda season at the time. So when we landed, we couldn't get the Carda season is like where everyone does the army courses, as you know. So uh, we couldn't get on any uh, any couldn't get me on any courses. Um, so they sent me on a skiing course. I know, mad. So we went up to Scotland somewhere. So on a skiing course. This is eighty two. Uh, yeah, with a couple of PTIs. Uh, really nice fellas. So on a skiing course, and then uh, we got, um, I think it was, might have been at the weekend. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. But somewhere along the way, um, my mum gets a, uh, a, a telegram that's just said Kandahar, and we were in Kandahar Barracks at the time, which means get your arse home. So I'm um, talking to my pal, and he goes, um, have you seen what's happened? The Falklands have been invaded. And I thought, fuck me. They're going to be in Glasgow by the fucking weekend. Because <laughs> I thought it was like the Isle of Sky. You legitimately thought that, yeah. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and we thought, fucking hell, you know, where are we going to make a stand, Adrian's Wall. So anyway, uh, uh, as I said, I'd only been in battalion weeks. Uh, some of it is a bit hazy, Hugh, but I'll, I'll do my best. So anyway, we come back to uh, battalion. I was fucking brand spanking out of the box. Uh, so were my pals there. Um, we packed up uh, and we went. You know, we went down. Uh, and I must admit, you know, on the camera, I didn't have my head around what war was. I was only a young kid, um, but I was hardwired from the depot. And you know what you like? You like a you like a fucking robot from the depot. And so that was it. Uh, a company uh, on the boat and uh, going down to uh, to the Falklands. What platoon? Yeah, it's in two platoon. Um, so uh, I was a fit kid, albeit I was probably weighing in at sixty three kilos because I was a boxer. Um, five foot six, five foot seven, uh, but I could carry my weight, you know, I was a strong kid. Um, but yeah, 63 kilos, I think I was fighting welterweight at the time. Um, so welterweight in, jun in junior para, and obviously the fitness took me through uh, uh, recruits, past speed company, first time. Um, so yeah, we went down there, and then um, the first sort of uh, live part of this was uh, landing in San Carlos, which is supposed to be like... I think it was supposed to be like a first light landing, uh, but it was fucking morning. So we uh, jumped off the landing craft uh, with the, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, we went. And you know, it's like trying to keep dry. Uh, we, we were carrying motor bombs and we were stacking them, plus we had all our kit. So straight off, freezing cold water up to your bollocks and, and, and higher. So you hit San Carlos, fucking freezing. Uh, but the Argentinians, they were making a withdrawal then, so it was more or less unopposed. Um, so we dug in. We, we we were we were talking about this just before we came on air 
about the Falcons, what it's like. And uh, so I, I was lucky enough to go there 20 years later, not during a war time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you don't, well, one thing I do know is you don't want to be like minute one, hour one, day one, week one of anything you're doing in the Falklands, you do not want to be dripping wet through yeah. at the start of it. Fucking soaking. <laughs> uh, it, and uh, you know me yoke on my webbing, it fucking broke. Um, so there was a fella there called Jock Early, he made a little loop out of paracord, sorted it out for me. So uh, digging, that's the first thing. And I was with another crow at the time, my, a good friend of mine, uh, and we were digging it, you know, we were digging in. Uh, some engineers came up uh, and they started uh, helping us, you know, uh, and we turned like a, it was a little more than a shell scrape into a nice house, you know, a sleeping area. And, and uh, I think we stole some, uh, sorry, I think we found some um, <laughs> sheep, you know, what do they call them? Like sheep rugs. You know, like skin sheep or whatever. The one was on a fence. We put yeah, it sheep down. skins, yeah, yeah, yeah. sheep skins. So we put it down. Uh, a few, few sheep ticks. Um, so that was it. Uh, and then, very quickly, I don't know how long. It, it, my first memory then, a helicopter went down, uh, a ditched, and so uh, um, our section went down uh, to see if there's any survivors. And it was in a bowl. Um, so we patrolled to it. It was in a bowl. And I tell you what, Hugh. If there was ever a fucking killing ground for mortars or, or sustained fire machine gun, it was that. So our section commander uh, and, the t and the two IC were there. Uh, we went down and it sounded like a, it was a ditched helicopter. Uh, it crashed. It sounded like a bird call, you know, like a high, high pitch. And uh, one of the crew members was still alive. So we went down into this, as I said, this god awful open ground. Uh, and when we picked him up, this fella, he sort of folded, he, you know, he smashed. And the only thing that was he was hanging on for was, was us. And when he gave up, you know, when he was like relieved to see us, he passed. And I thought, fucking hell. Because as I said, I was, you know, 17. Um, and I thought, this is getting real. And of course we were mortared, uh, the jets were coming in. They, I think they used to, well, they did, they called it Bomb Alley. So, um, so that was like the first taste of it. Um, and then, of course, it was, uh, you know, it, it, what happened then, it was uh, while we were waiting to go on the march, as it were, our, our boots, DMS boots, were fucking made out of, like, compressed cardboard, so a lot of people were getting trench foot. So my pal in the same trench as me, he's a lovely fella. Uh, uh, we've been friends in depot. He got trench foot. Well, the two of us did, and our feet were like, because we had, like, baby feet, because we were sprogs, do you know what I mean? So our feet were starting to rot. And people say, oh, it's bad drills, that. Well, fucking, we was doing the best we can, you know. Um, and he said, look at the my feet. boots were dog shit at the yeah. time, right? So my pal went, look at, look at my feet. And we was comparing our feet. They were in fucking rag. You know, like feet been in the bath for ages. And my pal says, look, I, I can hardly walk. I'm going to go see the, the medic. And, and I said, don't, don't go see him. Because we've heard about other people getting Kazivax. And he went, and, and he went, no, no, I won't go. And he went, you'll have no choice in the matter. So he went to see the medic, next minute he come back, he was packing his bergen, and he was fucking broken hearted, you know, because he was gone. So that was the first one I went through, and so I got paired up with another lad then. So then the march, so, um, you know, it was, uh, my feet were bad, Hugh. Um, my body was all right, but um, my feet were bad. Um, there were a lot of blokes like that. Yeah, they were varying degrees. Um, but as I said, with our baby feet, I think somebody all sweats. The feet were like fucking hooves. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but you know, para reg, we are we we look after our feet like fucking ballerina. Do you know what I mean? So uh, I was looking after my feet, but we were getting worse and worse. Um, and I remember on my eighteenth birthday, uh, I was in a, I was in a shell scrape. Uh, we we we'd been walking, uh, and uh, I, I tell this story a little bit. And I thought I had a, a stone in my shoe. And I thought, next time we start walking, we're patrolling. Um, I, th I thought, the next time we stop, I'm going to sort that stone out. <laughs> so when I took my boot off, my me, me second toe had, had, had flipped underneath my foot. Do you, do you know what I mean? So it was like oh a knuckle. So I'd been walking on it. But luckily, by that time, my feet was just... Numb. Yeah, my brain said to my feet, right, do you know what, index now, I'm going to ignore you. <laughs> I'm gonna eat, and uh, and I must. I emptied my boot out. It was like fucking porridge. It was like emptying porridge out, and I thought that ain't good. 
Now, along the way, there was a medic, and for the fucking life of me, I can't remember who he was, but he gave me uh, some DF-118s. Um, he also... What, what's that? They like painkillers. Okay. Um, God bless him. I just said, look, I just need to keep walking, and then I'll reassess it later. He gave me some injections in my ass. Um, I don't know what they were, but they were fucking agony. And in the end, he just said, look, I can't, I can't give you any more. And he given me. So I don't know what it was, but, mate, I was in fucking rag. And, and some of the other people there, they were in rag as well. But I thought, I can't, you know, I can't. I can't let me, I can't let myself stop. Not because I'm an hero, because I'm fucking stupid. Do you know what I mean? Because really, you know the score yourself, you don't declare an injury, potentially you become a fucking liability to that section. But I could still move, and I thought, and so I, I just said to me, my brain said to my feet, I'm not talking to you anymore. And they were in fucking fucking rag at one time my foot was growing into my sock oh, so when i took my sock off it was like peeling sheets of skin away oh my god so so then um on the night um and i've spoke to a couple of pals uh about this uh, on the night of longden um one of them is fantastic soldier john reeves um he was telling me because a lot of a lot of this i forgot so we was coming through at one time, uh, obviously um, you probably heard B Company, um, someone stood on a landmine and that woke up the Argentinians, dug in position, etc. Um, so we, when we came through B Company, who'd been decimated, um, I found out some of my pals had died. So uh, Jason Burt, uh, oh sorry, before that, sorry, before that, let me just rewind. On, on like the advance, the lad that was my uh, trench mate then, um, we used to build up rather than dig in because the ground was so so wet. When we was eating our dinner, we used to watch the mortars drop all around us, and there was absolutely no fear in us. We just went, oh yeah, look at that! You know that was close, and they were thudding all over. Later on, um, we got pinned down. Uh, we were behind this rise. Um, I'm not too sure whether we were returning fire or just we were trying to locate the enemy. Anyway, he was uh, next to me, shoulder to shoulder. Next minute, his, his head went down quick, and I thought, oh, he's, you know, he, he's having a moment. And then he started breathing really heavily and strange, and then I smelt it, and he'd been drilled uh, through the head, uh, God rest his soul. So I pulled him into cover and shouted to the section commander, look, he's, he's, been, he's been shot. And by the, because uh, we were asking for a Kazivak, but it, he curled up in a little ball. Where was this? It's just before, just before we started going up uh, London. Oh, I can't, okay. Yeah, I can't really remember exactly what it was. But on the approach, yeah, I don't know whether it. I seem to remember it was it was daylight, so I don't know if it was the day before. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, uh, so he lost his life. Um, and do you know what? Uh, there's a strange camaraderie, and you you know this, you. So someone shouts, "Oh, is he gone?" He went, "Yeah," and someone and someone shouted over to me, "Has he got any gloves?" <laughs> and I went, for fuck's sake, he's rocking. And then I had a rummage and, and found the gloves. Because all, even though it hurt us that one of our own had been uh, been took, you sort of got to, uh, you got to get your feelings in silo because we're going forward. So uh, I think we walked through a minefield ourselves, obviously walking be be behind each other. B Company, we walked through B Company, they give us the magazines and the 66s, which of course I think I've only seen one in the depot. And then, you know, and we were given a lot of grenades. I found out that three of my pals had, had been killed. Uh, um, Jason Burt, I think he was 17. Neil Gross, I think it was his 18th birthday. And a lad called Ian Scrivens. A along with some other, you know, uh, uh, other soldiers. But they were my pals, you know, since we were 16. So anyway, we moved through. Um, and that's when it sort of, uh, we was on the proper two-way range. Not much cover. There was loads of uh, like nooks and crannies where there was like rocks stuck, stuck, stuck up. They were uh, in uh, in trenches. It's a horrible feature. Horrible yeah, feature it is. It them. is, and you you know, and it uh, and it was it was uh, it was cold. Um, my feet were in rag, but I was I was bouncing around like a gazelle. So um, yeah, I was doing what I was told. Uh, John, as I said, some of the fantastic soldiers there, but I remember John. At one time, I was I was out on a bit of a limb and I needed to move, and John was firing, putting covering fire over, I was crawling into cover. Initially, we thought it was a dip in the ground, but it was just like a broken turf. 
And then we went forward uh, clearing trenches. Um, so my new partner for clearing the trenches, uh, so this is my third one. So as we were clearing trenches to be directed, and as you know, uh, grenades in first, pepper it with, with um, small arms fire, and then see what's in. So uh, we, uh, B Company give us loads of ammunition, so our rolls are... Uh, rolls me and my pal we throw grenades in and then there's ting ting it's bouncing all over so my pal goes fucking hell and it took the tip of his finger off a tiny tip and i got a little bit in my arm i went fuck oh, thick fuckers that we are um because we'd thrown two in the position of the rocks the shrapnel bouncing all over so i went are you all right and he went yeah yeah i'm okay and he went are you okay and he went yeah yeah i'm okay so we moved to the to the next position then my arm started feeling a little bit heavy now he had the smg and i had the slr and I went, I'm, I'm fucking finding it hard. So we swapped weapons and we carried on. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, 66s flying, you know, shadows in the night firing. Um, and then when we finished the battle, as it, as it were, and we went back to the um, the RV, as you know, the reorg, um, I said to the section commander, look, I'm not feeling right here. Um, my arm feels a bit wonky. So uh, it was swelling up, you know, like a fucking sausage in a pan. So we, so the section commander went, it's dislocated, don't worry about it. So I started pulling on my fingers to straighten my arm out. And uh, there wasn't much blood because I had a few layers on. Uh, there was hardly any blood. And then uh, he felt it, he went, now nah, you're going to have to go down to the uh, RAP. And I remember saying to him, I don't want to fucking go. I want to stay with you. Because I was, you know, I was scared of missing something. And he said, uh, I don't know if he remembers this, but it's probably the kindest thing fucking he ever said to me, the miserable fucker. But he said, uh, there's no one left to fight. It's done. And we was getting a few mortars coming in. So I went down to the RAP, they had a look at me. Um, and by this time, I was walking like an old man, like a fucking golem, you know what I mean? And he went, look, we're going to get you checked out. We're going to get you, you know, get, get you back to the platoon. But uh, they had a look at my arm and just went, nah, do you know what, it's going to need a minor operation. We'll bounce you to the hospital ship. And I went, I can come back, can't I? And they went, yeah. But apparently, once you're on a hospital ship, you fucking can't come back. It's like Geneva Convention shit. So I went on the hospital. They had a look at my arm. Fuck all, barely anything wrong with me. My feet were in rag. And, and that was the end. I didn't go back. So I left all my brothers over there. And uh, usually I won't... Uh, you know, you'd think, well, so what? The, the war was done then. But the lad who was my number one, who kindly swapped me the SMG, he got hit like the mortars in the last fucking hours of the war. Do you know what I mean? So fucking hell, Hugh, it was a fucking jinx. Do you know what I mean? Three people were with me. First one, you know, with his feet. The second one got shot. And uh, and the third one got hit. Um, so obviously a bit of ribbing. Um, but... But you know what, mate? I'm proud because I didn't stop. And that's because I'm, I'm not a fucking hero. It's because I was a fucking hardwired crow. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was a fucking programmed crow. I did what I, I, did what I was told. I fucking I flew at it. I carried my weight. And uh, the IWS I was uh, blessed with, which is a, a fucking lump of shit um, at, at night sight. So yeah, some ribbing um, from the lads, but uh, just to let me assure you, it was at the end. There was no more fighting to be done. Yeah, so three part, three parts. Last objective was Longdon, wasn't it? And then yeah. I think after that, tumble down was yet to be taken, um, which was uh, Scots Guards, yeah, wasn't Scots it? Scots Guards. Um, uh, but wait. yeah, is it, it's not. I mean, you say hard by when it is, but it's Danny. I mean, you'd, so your example there is a demonstration of the importance of camaraderie and esprit de corps so in the example that it, that camaraderie and esprit de corps that is drilled in that is not drilled in you can't drill in something like that there's there's like an intrinsic part of any fighting force which is worth its fucking weight in gold which is worth anything is that 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 emotional investment in the unit in the team in your mucker G's, uh, or three of them in your case yeah. um, is what drives the individual you to your apps beyond your limit you know 
yeah. you think Richard said very early on, you 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 kept you know you kept going. No, not just drum. me though. Hugh. No, I know not just I you. Mean, but we, you you just been telling yeah. the story. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, it's not, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, I know it's not just you. That's what, the point you're making is that camaraderie. Right. How important it is. I think it's a it's a, a, a big thing that's forgotten these days. A bigness thing, big thing that's forgotten, and one of the it's one of the one of the absolute cornerstones, the fabric of what makes the reg the reg and other other elite units what they are. You know. Yeah, well, I wasn't fighting for Thatcher. I wasn't fighting for the Falklands. I was fighting, I was fighting for my pals. And uh, where bullets are coming at you, and someone says move, and we're advancing to cover. I think if you're fucking sensible, you start doing a dynamic risk assessment. You won't fucking move. <laughs> but if you're Joe Crow with a head full of mints, you know what I mean. You are fucking going. <laughs> One of my pals, uh, we was behind this massive rock, and I was going to move, uh, and it, I just asked for some covering fire. He stood back, and this rock was like the fucking size of a shit house door. Do you know what I mean? He stood back and blasted about four SLR seven sixty two rounds into the rock. It's like he couldn't see the rock, and the fucking <laughs> the fucking rocks were flying everywhere because he just didn't see it. Do you know what I mean? Well, let me look, uh, Hugh. You're you're fucking paradise. I'll tell you this, state. When I'm telling you this, I'm I'm not set. This ain't false fucking. What do they call it? Uh, you know, oh, oh, everybody look at me. It's bullshit. I was fucking an average soldier in a very unaverage fucking unit. Do you know what I mean? Loads of people did more than me. Loads of people were fucking worse than me. My story is I did 100% the best I could and it broke my fucking heart. You know, when my pals died and it broke me out and I had to leave my section. Uh, but I take the only solace is there was no one left to fight. So when I come home, um, my feet, uh, I had size seven fucking feet, you know what I mean? I think my daughter's got size seven feet in a minute. Oh, but they got smaller? No, no, that's that was what my feet was. But oh. when I come back, I had size ten and a half Jesus feet. Christ. And they were like um, these white Navy pusser, um, horrible fucking trainers that I couldn't, you know, put the laces in. I look like a, a shit version of Run DMC, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, but as I said, mate, this is the word I was looking for. This ain't no false modesty. I fucking did this. This is my story. I don't remember a lot of it. Some of it, as I says, comes from trusted people. John Reeves and a very, very good friend of mine, Mick Southall, uh, who's like Mick. he's like the fucking yeah. oracle of para. You know, like you hear about these tribes where there's one person who knows the history from the first person. Mick, Mick Southall, I fucking love him like a brother, uh, and he, we was in para, uh, junior para together. Let me tell you, he uh, he is the guardian of, of the para story. Um, occasionally, he, he rings me up saying, someone's asking about you on Facebook, and I fucking told him straight. And I went, well, because <laughs> I'm not on Facebook. He's an, well, if you know him, he's a fucking star. He was, he, was, uh, he was one of the staff in Depot when I was in Depot. Yeah, he's a fucking brilliant. And dog. then um, he was on with, on 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 D and D's when on D &D. he's one of the instructors on D and D's. But um, I was going to say that. I mean, to be fair, mate, you were reluctant to even talk about the faultless piece before we came on. I asked you to do it. Can, can I say this to you, Hugh? Um, driving down to speak to you today, there's things that uh, my my thought process probably ain't like a lot a lot of people, and that's why I was a good undercover. Do you know what I mean? Um, and uh, I didn't want to tell you fuck all to be straight, um, but I know. <laughs> This is like sort of your, 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 not your job, but your job, if you know what I mean. And I thought, uh, it's the 40th anniversary today. And what I, and what I tell you uh, uh, about what happened. Um, so if anyone's listening, because I hear a lot of people saying, oh, Falklands, that was the war to end all wars. And you know what? It wasn't, and, and every war that these young kids are going into now, crows like me and, and other regiments, uh, that's their war. Do you, do you know what I mean? That's their Falkland. So you, I don't think you can start com comparing it. Do you know what I mean? It is, you know, they've got Gucci kit now. They've got, you know, um, and people supposedly, uh, you know, this PTSD, people are supposed to be looking after you a bit better. Mine was just, it was, you know, we was there a few weeks and I'm not, I'm not undermining it for the ones we lost there. But some of these young kids you see who come back from Afghan now, I look at them and they've got that thousand yard stare that I last seen, you know, with, with the lads from, from Three Para. So it isn't a fucking league table, do you know what I mean? You war you war. Everyone's got a, it's a personal thing and, and no war is, 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 is higher than, uh, than the other. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. I know what you mean. Do you know what? It's one of the things I've. It's one of the things I, I think I'm very fortunate to learn through, in doing this, um, in doing the podcast. It's one of the things I probably like you. Well, maybe like you at some point. Maybe like most people at some point who've done anything like our like an experience in contact, even just just fucking contact situation. Yeah. Let's just leave it at that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And to that individual, it's like holy fuck, I done that. Um, it, it, I mean, that is a unique experience to me. It's out of the ordinary, and you, there is, I think there is an element you think there is something special about that. Now, I know I definitely thought about like certain tours that I did, as in, holy shit, that was something different, right? And they're all different, uh, and plus your perception of it, your experience. No two tours are the same. No two patrols are the same. No two contacts are the same. No two ambushes are the same. No two fucking injuries are the same, right? Medical situations, whatever. Everyone experiences them differently, and you also have an impact on, on a different impact on everybody. One of the things I've learned through doing the podcast is, my God, even the even the people and the units, I think, what the fuck are they? They there's there's individuals in those units that have experienced some shit that goes way above and beyond what I ever thought was special about what anything I did, and, and I was just re- you know I was just reg like you, yeah. I mean, you know we weren't even SF or like that. Do you know what I mean? And you think and you think about what they did. There's people that experience stuff, and you go fucking hell. I'm glad I never experienced yeah. what you experienced. I'm glad it puts it into perspective. You know, um, I, 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 I do think, you know, every, every single, I generally think this, every, most members of the armed forces, most who have gone on an operation, which has some element of connected activity to it, they are fucking, they are salt of the earth. Yeah. They've got something major to contribute to society, whether they can do or not. They've got experience that, it makes them a more informed human being and a benefit just beyond the fucking planet because they've experienced that something that most people want and that is being close to death a, a more unique understanding of themselves about the fucking world around them and they place a value on life that most people don't you know you know what Hugh uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address that value on life in, in a second but um, just to sort of see out my days in in, uh, in Pararedge so um, came back to Pararedge Again, uh, did a little bit of boxing. I was one of the lads, you know, I could carry my weight. Um, I didn't moan. Um, tried some, some other things in the army that, that weren't really for me. Um, but as I said, uh, just to sort of draw a line under it, I was an average soldier in a fucking brilliant regiment. Um, I served with um, uh, James Deegan. Uh, not, I'm not uh, in the SAS. Um, n- and never was um, Bill Billingham, Simon Leake, uh, Guy Allman, Pete Longbottom, some fantastic fa- uh, Ian Gibson, fantastic people. Um, and because I was a bit of a nosy cunt, uh, uh, I liked uh, I, I liked um, gadgets, so I did the uh, signal course. Uh, and then what happened was I was drafted over to help out with the patrols, but because they called me a Morse monkey, and at the time. It was a morse monkey. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I, I fucking loved morse. So I taught, uh, you know, uh, uh, I took over running the signals for them. I was a Tom at the time, and my 2IC was a Lance Jack, uh, which is a bit crazy. But uh, so I didn't do anything special. Do you know what I mean? I was just fucking parrot edge. I did my time. Uh, um, ended up having some trouble uh, domestic wise. Um, I wasn't a good. I wasn't a good uh, uh, family man. Um, I was very Im- uh, immature father and family man, drifted away, and that sort of, um, I got to the age, I think it was about, let's see, 16, 26, 25, 26, and I thought, if I don't make a move now, I'm not going to be like a new new attractive prospect to the civvy street. So I got out and uh, and wanted to become a fireman. How old were you when you got out? I think it was 25, 26, when I come out of the, uh, come out of Pararedge, and uh, um, and I wanted to be a fireman more than anything, for two reasons. One, firemen fuck about a lot when they're off duty, playing tricks on each other, which I fucking like. And secondly, no matter how ugly you are as a firefighter, you're always going to get a really fit partner. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> now don't forget. <laughs> now don't forget when I went in Paredge, I was sixteen, and when I came out, I was twenty six. So really, I was only socially adept i was 16 and one day because i didn't need social skills in parage do you know what i mean so i thought i'm ugly i'm going to get a fit bird i'm going to join a fire brigade uh I'm, they do fantastic work we know this but uh the pals i knew they said they were telling me about all the brilliant tricks they were playing on each other and how all the wives were fit and i went right fuck it 
So I'm not being <laughs> sexist. As I said, I'm a different person than I was then. So, but the fire brigade weren't hiring. So I joined the police and uh, quite a lot of my family weren't fucking best pleased. <laughs> because, because some of them were involved in fucking criminality. So when you have to fill in a form to say, do you know anyone who's been a criminal? I said, uh, have you got another piece of paper? And they went both sides. I said, yeah, there's two sides to this. And I went, yeah, yeah, they're, they're fucking full. I need another one. But the bottom line was, you can't pick your family, do you know what I mean? To, uh, ten years in Pararedge, uh, you know, I, di I did okay. And I came home and, uh, and I joined the police. And that was the start of a fucking crazy adventure. Uh... What was so? You had an immediate thought. The immediate alternative option to fight fight the fire service was police. You had no inhibitions there. They weren't hiring. Otherwise, mate, I would have joined the fire brigade. Hundred percent. No, no, I know, I know. But sorry, yeah, I know that. But so, but you had literally zero inhibitions about the police, even though the the, the criminal family. Uh, you thought, fuck it, go for well, it. Well, it wasn't that. Just balls but, out. But I heard um, when I was speaking to some uh, some cops. I heard, you know what? It's uh, the money ain't great, but it ain't bad. But it's interesting work. So yeah. it's about 1990 now, right? Uh, 1990, it was. Yeah, it, yeah, was yeah. Uh, it, it was 1990. Um, and I thought, you know what? I, I can give it a go because it was still in the back of my mind. I'd do this for a couple of years. When the fire brigade uh, start mm -hmm. recruiting, I'll, I'll hop over to them. So, um, You're initially... still living in Manchester? Yeah, I yeah. was, uh, was living in uh, Manchester at that time. So, and I thought, yeah, you know what? I'll give, I'll give the cops a go. So they posted me to a place in North Manchester called Harper Hay, which is uh, um, it's quite a tough area. Um, and the people are tough, but fuck me, they're good people. And there's a, a small cr criminal element. You've got Cheetah Mill on one side, you've got the city centre a couple of miles away. Well, elaborate on that, tough but good. What do you mean? Describe the community. Just like, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think. To a certain extent, there's some members of our community where criminality is their normality through necessity. Fucking hell, I'm, I sound brainier than I am. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> the, good, the good, the good people, but for them to buy a fucking joint of bacon from the pub, which has obviously been nicked, for them is is just normality. Um, some drug deals up there, but no one had grass. Do, do you know what I mean? No one had stick stick the people in. They just went about the, the business looking after each other very family oriented just really really good people but but tough people uh, a bit rough and ready you know in how they spoke but fucking great people strong family values yeah, loyal. strong strong family values don't get me wrong in in any urban conurbation you're going to get good people and bad people but then people there they were good people on the whole but there was a criminal element there um so there were certain places you could go to where people would say you know um, my drive's blocked and I want the police round here now. Whereas there, they just fucking push it out of the way. You know what I mean? They were good, good, strong people. And they were my people. Why do you think, right? So I, I thought with this, this this year, you don't get those kind of communities in uh, uh, in the south of England. And you certainly don't get them, cl get them closer to the, to the, to the, the major, well, the capital, capital cities of each country, really. So when I think about Wales... The nearer the card, if you get, the less those communities are like that. The deeper into the valleys you get, the more the communities are like what you're just talking about. Up north, the yeah. further up north you get, the more those communities are like that. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things. It could be in the big cities, you've got such a diverse and fragmented, you know, social demographic. You've got people coming in, who, who, you know, not from Cardiff, all different people. Some people who are there and they just, you know, I've had houses, uh, Hugh, where I've lived in and, I, and uh, uh, you know, I've not known my neighbour's second name, you know, and I've, uh, I barely speak to him. I've had other houses where, you know, people are, uh, 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 not know your business, but look after you. Uh, a little bit close, uh, a little bit closer. So uh, I don't really know, and I don't know whether it's a north-south thing. But, but uh, as I said, when they sent me up there, some some quite some quite tough challenges. I th do you know what I think a lot of it is to do with? Come on. I think a lot of it is to do with one weather, and two resource availability, and three distance to ship, which is resource availability. Yeah, I think that's what it is, because it's just it's like back to the Wales example and that north example, and then you've got Scotland as well. It's just hard living. It's hard living, yeah. and stuff is harder to get. And plus, work isn't as well paid as for forthcoming because yeah. you're in the sticks. Um, that's, I think that's part of what I think. Well, I think uh, the, the full the full work 
uh, pro the way people work now is changing because you can you know you can work from home there's a lot of people working from home so i don't know and you know what mate it, it, it's too big a question hugh it's, it hurts me fucking head Do you know sorry, what I'm sorry mate. oh no <laughs> well because you know I'm, some people have said to me in the past what's boris johnson doing about this and i said well when I spoke to him on Tuesday, he, he, <laughs> did, he didn't mention out, and they go, you're fucking joking, aren't you? And I went, well, you fucking started it. How the fuck do I know what Boris Johnson's thinking? So um, so when I was on my probation up there, they put me with this um, with this guy. He's, he's, he's been in about four or five years. So I'm walking down the road with him, um, and there's a guy comes walking towards us, and he's got a, a video recorder under his arm, which tells you how fucking long ago it was. So as he's walking towards us, this this prick I'm with is saying, you will be buying me my lunch. And I went, look, I'm no one's fucking crow, but I thought, you know what, bite the bullet. This is in the cops. Yeah, it's a fucking idiot he was. So as we're walking down the road, this fella comes walking towards me, and it, and, and you see it in his body language, he's like a fucking cat on, on a hot bricks. So he's just come walking around the corner, he's faced by us. So he's, sh- he's, he's shitting himself because he's bleeding. Well, he's just, he's just fucking yeah, braces, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, that, yeah. you know, that fight or flight thing. So I go to him, you all right, our kid? I went, don't run. Don't run. So I walks up to him and uh, and me uh, me tutor at the time goes, you deal with this. I went, you all right, our kid? And he went, yeah, yeah, I'm all good. So I goes, um, what's the crack with that? Where are you going with that? That video recorder. He says, oh, uh, just boy off me pal. So I looked at it uh, and the at the bottom of the plug, there was it was white. It was a black plug, but it was white and stretched. He just fucking yanked it out. He'd not even unplugged it. He's obviously been there, so he yanked it out. So I was looking at him and went, right, there's one strike. And I said to him, uh, so where'd you get it? He went, I bought it off my mate. And my mate's, I've got a receipt here for it. And I went, right, you're fucking locked up, kid, for burglary. So this prick who was with went, but he's got a receipt. I went, who writes a fucking receipt for the pal? Do you know what I mean? Who fucking writes it? So I says to him, right, so what's the crack with you, kid? And he went, uh, no comment. I went, listen, if you nicked it there, you fucking ruined someone's day. Just tell me where it's from and we'll sort some out. Because you're the junkie, aren't you? You're rattling to fuck. And he went, I am rattling to fuck. I said, you need help. That's what you need. And he went, you're right. I do need help. I got it from such and such. So this prick with me goes, you've, you, you've, um, you've interviewed him then. You should have given him a solicitor and all like that. I went, oh, fuck off. Surely to God. Um, but he was right. Me, me tutor was right. Because what I'd done was like an illegal interview. But the person got their video back. This kid got some help being a junkie. Um and so, uh, how did he get help? What did you? What well, you just said he's fucking rattling. You know, he, he's fucking. He's but did you refer him on? To something? Yeah, just fucking. Yeah. There's nothing to me. He just said to the, the custody sergeant, "This fellow needs a drug worker. He's probably back on the needle." Plus, he did on. nick him. He did nick yeah, him. Yeah, oh, fucking, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. He told, well, of course, he told me where he fucking burgled the thing <laughs> from. <laughs> you know what I mean? But apparently, anyway, big dudes, little dudes. So this this fella said, "I can't work with you." So they put me in charge with the, uh, uh, this other fella who'd been moved from CID to uniform, really nice fella, and he, he, you know, he showed me the ropes. Um, and so very, very quickly, um, out of my probation, I was invited into the CID, um, and, I, and you know, I really enjoyed it. And then when I was in the CID, so I've been in now, usually to get in the CID, like four or five years or something like that. I was in the CID like two years, fucking three weeks or something, uh, three weeks out of my probation. In fact, it's probably even less, anyway. So this bloke come up to me, pulled me and says, uh, can I have a word with you? Uh, uh, because the CID, they used to have me translating what people were saying, you know, the street language. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And at the time I was living in, in the police station. So it was my life. You know, I really enjoyed it. Uh, hang on. They, they, they had you translating what people were saying? Because yeah. the slang was that strong and you yeah, understood it. Yeah. So like, um, so... Uh, the other day, my man was bouncing down the road. Uh, uh, he was in his new whip, and next minute, the boy them seeing him, he had to jet because some fuck was going to get murked, and then the five o was on him. And then the, the cops went, "What the fuck did he just say?" And then I, you know, I translate it. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so this bloke uh, pulled me to one side. I'd been in about three and a half years, and he said, uh, "Would you like to to come work with me and buy drugs and guns?" And I went, "Mate, I'm not fucking bent." My family's bent, but I ain't fucking bent. And he went, no, you fucking idiot, as an authorised undercover police officer. And I went, oh, yeah, all right. And he went, well, you have to go on a course. I went to buy drugs. And he went, yeah, I went, it's fucking easy. Junkies are doing it every fucking day. <laughs> and he went, no, no, no. You have to, you know, you have to go on this course. So the court, the, um, they did this psychometri- psychometric testing on me. And apparently, 
uh, what did they say? I lacked certain social fucking graces. <laughs> I thought, what a cunt. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but true. Um, and the other thing, I thought I was, th- I went to a great school, but I pissed that off. And I went and got tested by the um, Mensa, and I was 136 on, on Mensa, which 142 is genius. And I thought, fucking hell. How I didn't even, I fuck knows. I thought, <laughs> but they say, you know, even a monkey, a load of monkeys in a room with a typewriter, one of them will write a book. So I thought, fucking hell, I didn't know. I didn't know I was brainy. I knew I was sharp, but I didn't know I was, I was, I was brainy. So this fella says, well, you need to come on this course. Uh, and there's like 200, I think it was 180, 200 people who'd, who'd wanted to do it and been to open days. I don't know how many got approached, but I went on the course. Um, and it was me and a senior customs officer who who passed the course, but he didn't. He attended the course. Uh, I, there was only two of us who got to the end of the course, as it were, and I was the only one who passed. And I must admit, I thought, it's a fucking dot all this. Because it's it's going into houses to buy drugs. Ah, yeah. Are you selling drugs? Yeah, I'm buying them. Yeah, let's let's sell it. And the course that that I was on, the the set it up like we were going into live theatres, and it was existing, um, un- trained undercover that were playing the enemy. So describe the course to me. Well, let me tell you about the unit. The unit was called Omega, and it was initially set up in the uh, late eighties, early nineties by a guy called Henri Exton, who, uh, who set it up. Um, the Met were trying to infiltrate um, football hooligans. I don't know the ins and outs what happened, but um, Greater Manchester Police, they set this unit up to infiltrate, um, I think it was Man City, uh, hooligans. There were successful prosecutions, and it was called uh, Operation Omega, so that name stuck. Uh, so um, later on, that developed and they started using that tactic, that infiltration tactic, and the definition of infiltration to enter gradually and secretly and having entered remain in situ. That's the definition. So Omega then started using it to infiltrate uh, drug dealers, uh, post homicides, uh, where they were getting people to admit, um, you know, their involvement in murders. Uh, and then in 1990 ish, they deployed into Moss Side uh, on two operations, Operation China, Operation Miracle, and they blasted all the drug dealers there because it was a no-go area, uh, and they went and they bought drugs um, right across and sent loads of people to jail. So it gravitated from that. But those deals, on uh, I mean, the murders were, were fantastic uh, cases, and it was about police being lawfully audacious. That means working within the law but looking at it in different ways. Do you know what I mean? Well, how can we? How can we not test the boundaries of the law? But how can we use the law to substantiate us using this tactic? So, Operation China, Operation Miracle. Nowadays, you'd probably call that a test purchase because that's a, like a low-level deal where where you would go in, you would buy some drugs, and that would be like the uh, evidential icing on a cake because you know you'd have phone traffic or you'd have observations. So um, that developed into full-time level one. So I went on the full-time level one course and I pissed it. I I pissed the course. Um, To piss the course, you needed to be a bit robust. And what happened was, what I carried over from Parareg is, there is nothing anyone can do to me in this fucking world that Parareg and, you know, and Falklands were going to do to me. So I hadn't already done kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, that I don't that had done to me or tried to do to me. So it, it's not that it was reckless. I just thought, you know what? If you think I'm a cop, you ain't gonna fucking kill me. You might give me a bad beating, but you're not gonna fucking kill me. And if you do, you fucking do, and I can't do nothing about it. So that parareg thing about being confident in my training made me exude not a criminal confidence, but a personal confidence that criminals perceived as a criminal confidence. Mm, do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And also, my uncle, uh, God, God rest his soul, he had, he'd taught me, you know, I've been, uh, I've been around pubs all my life. I know how to act with people. Do you know what I mean? I know it when it's your round. I don't want someone being a cunt when it's not there around and they're dodging it. You know what I mean? Sorry, when it's there around and they're dodging it. Anyway. So the course was, um, so uh, I'll give you one of the scenarios, I won't give you all of them. So we had to go and buy um, 30 MOTs, um, and I had to take this lad. Fake MOTs? Yeah, fake, well, 
No, real MOT is just the fucking writing on him was fake. <laughs> <laughs> so, the scenarios I've been involved in, basically I had to go to a house, there was a load of heavies there threatening me, who the fucking hell are you? You know, and I went, mate, what about 10 E's? And he went, who the fuck are you? I went, what the fuck's all this about? Give me the E's, don't give me the E's, I'm going to fuck off. Because I thought, that, this is all a bit much. So they give me the E's and, and I'd go. And I wasn't phased by him. And so they sort of took the foot off the gas with me because I knew what I was doing. My commodity knowledge was good. My knowledge of the law was good. Uh, because I was a you know, former soldier, I did my research. So this fella who was with me, I'm in the car. <laughs> I'm in the car driving to a pub in Salford with him and he's going to go in and buy these 20, 25 MOTs. So he says to me, what what should I do? And I went, firstly, get that fucking tie off. <laughs> get that tie off, you barmy fucker. So he takes his tie off and went, when you go in, <laughs> just get the man, there'll be a Manchester Evening News somewhere there. Have a look at Manchester Evening News and whatever's there, just speak about a story at the bar with someone. I will be here ready for you, ready to go. He goes, right, okay. So he goes into the pub um, and he comes out about 20 minutes later running and he's fucking, he's, he's like putting on his clothes, running towards me. I went, what the fuck? So he jumps in the car. Uh, I spin the car around and these two fucking heavies are running at us. So I sort of drive a little bit at him, a little bit. So, <laughs> <I> said, <laughs> so he jumps in the car and I'm fucking blasting him and these two fellas jump out of the way on the course and I'm thinking fucking hell right if anyone says out did you see the knife and he went what knife and he went no wrong answer did you see something glittering at his belt and he went it was awful I went in there <laughs> <laughs> he said I went in there oh my god I got the man streaming in news I got a GNT and I'm like oh fucking hell <laughs> and what did you say he said I said to this chap next to me I was looking at the Manchester news and I said have you seen Euro Disney shares have tumbled? And the oh bloke went, God. what the fucking hell are you talking about? Next minute, they grabbed me and pulled me in the toilet and they stripped me. So they scared the life out of this poor fucker. But at the time, we weren't told these were UCs. So later on the debrief, they went, anything happened? They went, yeah, I think I saw a knife because they were coming at me. And I had to sort of like drive past them. I might have got close to one of them. But I was trying to not knock them down, but shift them. Then later on, of course, they turned out to be undercover. I've nearly fucking ran over. Um, so the course was, it wasn't particularly challenging. They, they did a bit of escape and evasion. Uh, well, it wasn't even escape and evasion. Drop you in the middle of nowhere and you have to get back home. It weren't hard. Uh, it was really enjoyable. Uh, and I loved it and I liked the people. Uh, and so they said to me, halfway through it, they said, uh, we don't like your attitude, you're a cocky fucker. Um, go home, we might not ask you back for week two. So I went home and I said to my missus at the time, the fucking, if they don't want me back, fuck them. And my missus went, do you not think it could be a ruse to try and snap you? I went, oh, fucking staff, are you? Directing fucking staff. <laughs> well, of course, it turns out she was a million percent right. Because they fucking rang me and invited me back. And I passed the course. It, um, and so I landed in, uh, in uh, well, so, and they said, if the vacancy comes up, you know, we will consider bringing you in. We'll bring you in for bit parts. But two months later, I was in the unit. Um, and that's how I entered into it. How old were you? I don't know, 28, something like that. Some, something like that. Or 25, 28, 29, something like that. How, how, what were the unit like? Were they tall and uh, long in the tooth, the other guys that were there? Not so much long in the tooth. There was like a split in the office. A lot of them were uh, old detectives, uh, a couple of them from the football days. And there was a split. And there was some of them we were sort of, because uh, we were developing now away from these small street buys into going up the, you know, the criminal ladder. So um, there was a, there was an element who was sort of still running around at the lower level, and then there was a higher level element. But I must admit, the first day I landed, it, like anywhere, so uh, Joe Crow, head full of mints, I land at the unit. Uh, uh, there's a load of people there. Some of them I see from, I recognise from the course, some of them I don't. I have me uh, welcome brief from the boss, and then I turn around, everyone's fucked off. So I'm on my own. No, no tutor, no mentor. Uh, and so in undercover, what you have to do is you have to get a thing called a legend, which is like a, a believable backstory. So I'm on my fucking own. And, and for me, later on, when I became uh, a little bit better thought of there, I made sure that never happened again. Because I'd got through the course, they'd invited me, um, I was going full-time undercover, and they left me fucking iron dry. So I went, right, fuck it. So I went into the technical store, 
and there was a load of videos there, you know, top class blank videos. So there was a bag there. I tipped all the, uh, I tipped a load of videos out into this bag. I got a taxi from our covert unit. Uh, well, it wasn't covert. It was the top of a police station. And later on, we got to a covert unit. I said to the driver, where, uh, sorry, I came out, walked about a kilometre, got in a cab and said to the driver, where's the biggest shit hole pub around here? And he said, such a place. So I went down and uh, when I got there, I said to the landlord, because I've been in pubs and I knew the drill, do you want to buy any blank uh, tapes? Because that's what you do, you offer it to the landlord first. And he went, yeah, yeah. So he bought a couple and then I sold a couple more, um, started speaking to local people. They said, what's the crack? You know, I says, oh, I've just moved down here, been living down south with my missus. All right, um, you all right for a smoke? And I went, no, nah, my missus is. I says, I'm training at the minute, you know, I'm boxing, blah, blah, blah. So I bought some weed, got a couple of telephone numbers, had a few beers. Then when I went back to the unit, I thought, still no one there. I wrote up what I'd done on a bit of A4. I left the weed in an exhibit bag and I left the change. What was the reason for selling the tips? To, to sort of, no one gave me any direction and I had to set myself up as a criminal. Ah, in the area. Yeah. Ah, right. So you're just going down and basically so, introducing yourself yeah, yeah. as the criminal. Yeah, okay, yeah got it. And, got it. and even the top drug dealers who are in boozes like that, they're going to have a look what's in your bag. So um, I wrote it down, what I'd done, and then the next day when I come in, they fucking blasted me. The boss went, unauthorised purchasing of drugs. I went, mate, it's a fucking scrap of weed. And it was to enhance my cover. No, no, you can't fucking do this. I went, well, what, what do you expect me to do? So they went, right. I said, I need someone just to give me a stay. So they started placing me then with some undercover there. Some of them were good. Some of them were shit. Um, and some of them, I was, I, because of my background, I was, compared to them, I was the fucking real deal. You know, I knew, and the police had crashed at my door uh, when I was a young man at home. I was related to criminals. I knew, I knew the language, I knew the commodity prices. Uh, and so very quickly, when they were running the next course, I said, listen, I have some ideas. I wouldn't mind running that course. I think the next course, they did it, um, and I was like a, a role player on it. And then the course after that, I took over. Um, running the whole course? I was like the uh, directing, you know, like the... Uh, you, you had like a, you know, like the boss who ran things. But I said... If I can, or if I may, can I rewrite this course? And I said, look, there's no point pretending this is real, right? Because it fucking ain't. Before they come on the course, we're getting some right Walter Mitty cunts here now. Let's do like a little mentorship. Let's have some selection involved, whereby before they even start getting, um, uh, what's the word, on the course, let's paper sift them, if they're fucking knobs. Then let's go to a head-to-head. -head. Let me sit across the table from him once they've gone through the paper sift and let's see what they like. Because if they crumble with us sat in a training school, they're going to crumble on the roads. So uh, we had um, uh, like a mentor mentorship. So paper sift, then the head-to-head. -head. Then we give them a big law package, commodity knowledge. So when they were go to see the psychometric people, the fucking, they've got their head on for it, do you know what I mean? So we were not wasting time, because out of 200 people applying on a course, there'd only be eight on the course. And we'd have some, like, backup who needed, you know, to help us to be welfare support officers. So the other thing is, I spoke to the undercover that I knew, because I'd been busy in my first year, I was on 10 undercover jobs. And I said to everyone, tell me the worst case scenario you've done in your career, and come and run it on the course. And they would run, they would role play that and run it. And the course, fucking hell, mate, it was brilliant. It was um, commodity knowledge was tested, break down a kilo to a £10 bag deal on what's the profit margin, how much is a gun, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, use of technical devices, um, infiltration tactics, and it was, mate, it was a brilliant course. It was uh, sleep, sleep deprivation, um, and it was good. It went from strength to strength because every scenario now was a real scenario but ran in, in real time as a role player. Um, and then later on, so that was a level one undercover course. And wh whilst I wasn't doing that, I was smashing it. I was all over the country buying drugs, guns. Um, I was a contract killer for someone who wanted uh, their partner killing and subsequently their partner's children killing. Um, what else? That was Shop on a job? Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, talk about that. 
All right, right. I'll, I'll try and shield it a little bit. So um, this person approaches a doorman and says, I want to get rid of me. Uh, in fact, I want to get rid of my partner. I mean, this is... I'm, we don't I'm, have I'm, to... I'm, I'm saying to. OPSEC, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll be careful. So basically, <laughs> they wanted to get rid of their partner. Um, and later, after the partner was got rid of, their children because oh this was like a step God. relationship and because it was 20 quid uh, 20 quid that means 20 grand it was 20 quid for the uh, for the adult and 10 quid each 10,000 each for the children um so uh they approached this doorman who shit himself um how do you know that was the price is that street it, price it, at well, the time it, it's very much dependent on on what the person has got money wise do you know what I mean? And, and what the demand is from yeah, the yeah, and, and how difficult it's going to be. So there's not a really a set price. A set price, mate, can be can be a pound, and and I'll I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. So anyway, uh, went to a doorman. Doorman <laughs> shat it. Didn't know what to do, but bumped into this fucking nutcase who told everyone he was an army person. <laughs> so the army person, he wasn't army. He went to speak to this individual. They brokered a deal. They got some money up front, but this Walter Mitty cunt then shat himself and spoke to the police. And then I came, <laughs> and then I come in. Now, with this fucking lunatic, he, he's called a participating informant, and it's very, very dangerous because you, 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 because the, the criminals. So this participating informant was going to introduce me as the hitman. So I said to this barmy fucker, have you told him anything about me? And he went, no. Uh, are you sure? No, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. Are you sure? Yeah, no, I haven't. Are you sure? No, I haven't. As we go into the meeting, as we open the door to the pub, he says, I better tell you, I told him that me and you were in the SAS. Oh, we my both, God. We both killed a Bahrainian fucking carpet seller. Uh, we shot him in the face and buried him in the desert. I went, right, okay. <laughs> so this barmy fucker then, so we sit down, and this bloke says, who's brokering the deal, says, uh, I believe you used to have done work in the past. And I went, what, what I've done in the past is fuck all to do with you. And I said to the informant, fuck off over there. You don't need to listen to this. Right, what's the job? So... That was it. Uh, and they got um, seven years and nine years each, the people who were soliciting someone for murder. Uh, shop stings, where you set yourself up buying stolen goods. You know, people were coming in, they'd bring stuff. Um, i tell you, it's not a funny, a funny job, but, well, it is. So I'll tell you this one. So I'm really, really early in my service. We're buying uh, drugs uh, across my side. And it's bad days, quite dangerous. Uh, a lot of gunmen, uh, but selling drugs. So I hook up, uh, this, like a, this was before I sort of gravitated into, you know, oh, I, I was on armed robbery teams as well, got offered a lot of money to be involved in armed robbery teams, blah, blah, blah. Um, post homicide, getting alongside murderers. Um, but this is quite a funny one, quite early in my service. So when I'm out and about buying drugs, um, low level drugs, but still quite, quite dangerous, call it test purchasing now. There's a guy, and he's robbing students. He's, a, he's an abuser, a junkie. Uh, he's robbing students to get money to buy drugs, and he's buying, not big drugs, but enough for dealer amounts that he's getting his drugs for free. Do you know? Does that make sense? So I bump into him, and he takes a shine to me. And so I go out with him, because he's robbing fucking students, and when he's, when he's with me, he's, you know, he's obviously not robbing students. Um, so he's going to introduce me to his dealer, who's a very fucking violent gunman, etc. cetera. So um, I, what the plan is, because he's so violent, this gunman, I'm going to get surveillance around me. When I meet this guy, I'm going to make a minor buy because he's got a, a pot of drugs. And when he drives off a few mile, he's going to get a routine stop and grabbed by the police and locked up. And the amount he has would s substantiate a charge of possession with intent. So I've got a surveillance unit and an armed strike team. And I, I've only been doing it a little while. So I go, uh, I'm go. i supposed to meet this fella at the roundabout. Anyway, he's not there. So I go to his house. And he's a bad man, this fella, violent. So I knock on his door. And his missus lets me in. And goes, where is he? Because we're supposed to go out to meet this fella. Oh, he's in bed. So he goes upstairs and he's smacked out of his head. Fucking off his jangles on heroin. Fucking hell. So I'm lifting him up. It's like lifting water. So anyway, I get him half dressed. And... Uh, I've got a surveillance team, the arm strike team behind me. And it's, it's like lifting water up. So I stand him up on the top, like at the top of the stairs, and I'm putting a coat around him. 
he's fucking dropping things on his floor. And as I turn around to pick his keys up, he goes oh, yeah. backwards down the stairs. Oh, my God. Boom, 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 boom. He's like the start of fucking EastEnders. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> and I look at him, and his body's all twisted at the bottom. And I thought, I've killed this fucker. I fucking killed him. So his missus looks at me. And, and in my mind, I thought, but he's got to go. You know, he's got to go and help me on this job. And I went, and it just popped out. Oh, he's got to go. And she went, ah, you're going to kill him. And I went, I'm not going to kill him. So she's going fucking bananas. But because he's so full of heroin, he's all floppy. And he shouts, fucking hell, what's happened? I went, oh, my God, thank you. You're not dead. So I'm in a bit of a tiz. His arms <laughs> point in a different way. So I thought, I'll go to the meet and then I'll get him sorted. So look. <laughs> Broken arm. Well, probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he's all right, you know. He's self-administered his pain relief. So, we fucking I, I load him up to the car, and he's still off his tits. We go on this meet, and when I'm on this meet, um, this guy comes to meet us, and we're, you know we're going to buy buy three of him, is it? Well, we're going to buy some drugs off him. So, um, but in my in his eyes, I'm an horrible junkie. So I give him the money to buy a few, a few bags of uh, a few bags of, ro- of um, heroin, a couple of rocks, and he throws them on the floor. I want to go and pick him up. He kicks me in the side of the head, and fuck, you know when you get caught right on your ear, and it's fucking yeah. ringing. And I'm looking at him, thinking, I'd quite like to drive your nose bone through your brain here now, but I'm subservient. Do you know what I mean? So I went, all right, no trouble, no trouble. Because you're in the role of a junkie. Yeah, yeah. Well, a, a little, just a little bit above the junkie. Mm. And luckily, this fella is in the back of the car and he can't even get out. But he's he's my reference. Do you know what I mean? So um, I get the dr- uh, get the uh, the drugs. I take him to the hospital. He's fucking his arms broke. Um, and then uh, they strike on him um, when he's away. But they've seen they've seen him give me a kick, so they know he's a violent man. And some of the people who uh, arrested him, they know me. Um, so my ears cut, you know, and I'm feeling a bit humiliated. And then, uh, anyway, he was arrested. Um, and that, uh, he went away for a long time. Right, someone's just committed murder. They're on the run. Or they don't, or they're not, maybe not on the run. Maybe they think they've got away with it because they've hidden the tracks really well. They're obviously super fucking paranoid and cautious. How on earth? Do you go about infiltrating someone like that? Well, oh it's not, not usually on the toes, because if you're on the toes, you, once you get found, they're getting fucking grabbed. Do you know what I mean? This is like um, post-homicide. This is like cold case. You know when they've fucking done it, but no one can prove it. So uh, you just get alongside people. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. So it's getting along. It's getting alongside people, um, befriending them, and then uh, some of them, um, tell you information that's either so intimate it's got to be then, or they're telling you um, quite clearly. You know, it's them. So yeah, post homicide. Well, I'm not going to so go. So you're trying to draw out a confession then? No, it's not so much a confession because there's a thing called Section 78 of Pace, which is using dirty tricks. Uh, um, to uh, well, I think it's Section 76 and 78. It's using a dirty trick. Well, this isn't a dirty trick. So I'm your pal, and you might say to me. Uh, um, I've got a lot in my mind. I went, mate, well, don't be fucking sharing your bullshit with me. And he went, no, no, you know where, uh, you know, I was locked up for murder. And I went, well, yeah, obviously. And then that person fucking says, but I'm trying to, I, I'm not, what's the word? I'm not bypassing the codes of practice. He's fucking volunteering this information to me. And again, that's gone to court and it's been, it's been deemed as lawfully audacious. It's been accepted at court. You know what I mean? I've not, as Jean provocateur him, I've not, I've not like, tell me something sexy and I'll give you money or you can, you know, you can, you can shout words me. in the mouth, did you kill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did kill. Hands yeah, up yeah, if yeah. you killed anyone. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so, but then people who'd killed people and, and I did a few, they didn't really bother me, you know, because they weren't going to kill me. You know what I mean? Any job, any jobs did bother you? Because you got, didn't you yeah. get involved with the Somali gangs at one point? That was in the gang unit, uh, but no, uh, they, the Somali guys, tough guys. T- Somali people, mate, amazing people in Manchester, but there's a criminal element to him who aren't so amazing. Yeah, I was on one. I won't go into the ins and outs of it, but let me tell you this. I was in a situation whereby uh, a child a child was missing. I was the fucking last stop saloon to try and find this kid. Uh, Why is that? What was the situation then? What uh, they tried? They believed the child had been snatched from the bed 
Uh, I won't go into ins and outs of it, but I was alongside the fella. And uh, during the course of this, I had to try and uh, find out where the kid was. Because certain amount of time passes when a kid, <coughs> a five, six-year-old kid, he's, he's gone. So, this is my plan, and I'm not proud of it. Um, and with this fella and the cut-off time, let's say I agree a cut-off time to be with this fella. As I said, it, uh, it sounds like I'm fucking being evasive, but I'm, I, I'm not. So I'm with this fella in a certain set of circumstances whereby uh, uh, I agree with my welfare, my support officer, that come six o'clock, I am going to be taken out of this situation. So uh, my welfare knows me. So my plan is this, you, this kid's missing. I'm going to do my best, all my infiltration skills to, to find out where this kid is. But come five o'clock in my head, I'm going to start torturing this fucker. I'm going to fucking torture him to find this kid. So anyway, quarter to five, I'm, I'm removed from company with this person and I'm kicking and screaming because my welfare knows me. My well, fuck no. And your concern is that the longer it goes on, the less likely it is to find this kid and that kid's gone. So I'm you're going like, to torture the kid. Now. I'm, going to to I'm going to torture that man at five o'clock. My last ditch effort, I'm going to maintain my integrity as a police officer. But come five o'clock, I'm fucking, I'm gone. I'm got, you know, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to, I'm going to take him now. So anyway, at quarter to five, my welfare extracts me from the situation and I'm fucking in a bad way. He dragged me out, uh, 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 out of the situation. I'm in a bad way and he sent me in this office and uh, my support officer comes in and he goes, I knew what, what he was going to do. He'd been my support officer for a lot of jobs. I think I ended up doing about 100 um, in various roles, sometimes walk on, sometimes longer. And he says, I knew what you was going to do and I'm not letting you do it and fucking go to jail. So I went, right. Has the kid been found? He went, yeah, the kid's been found. The kid had been raped uh, and killed. Five, six-year-old kid uh, and dumped. Um, and I went, when did when did she die? And the only solace I got from it was she died before I even went into uh, proximity of this fella. So uh, my, pa my pal says, what do you want to do now? I went, I don't know. I don't know. What, what do I do? So, uh, yeah, that threw me. That, that threw me. What the fuck is wrong with people? Yeah. And you know what I should have done on reflection? Tortured that fucker the first minute I seen him. But anyway, I didn't. So, uh, yeah, some some funny things have happened along the way, <laughs> Hugh. Uh, uh, I had uh, I was into these armed robbery team. Um, they weren't very bright. And we were having a drink, and he, uh, he introduced himself as the, the strongest... So undercover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the strongest, uh, the strongest drinking man in in the history of the parachute regiment. That's what he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, thinking you're just another, you're just another, Mate, you're just a uh, criminal. It, right? it, it doesn't really use your background. No, it doesn't because it's quite a close family. You start dropping that you, uh, as we've seen when we go walt hunting, you start dropping you're in pararege very quickly. You get you're getting pinged. So I went, wow, fucking hell, pararege. He says, was you in that, in the uh, Falklands? He went, yes, I was in the Falklands. I went, what, <laughs> what were you in? He went, 289. <laughs> I went, you yeah, had have heard of them. <laughs> I'm thinking, what the fuck? He just said like three random yeah, numbers. Three random numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so apparently he joined the army, went to Harrogate, said he was going to be in Paradise and then fucking never did anything after that. Um, so I went, wow, tell me about it. And he went, fucking pull up a, t pull up a fucking table. I went, you, mate, you are fucking amazing. And after about two weeks, they all they had a vote, and he was voted out, and I was voted the boss of the armed robbery team. <laughs> <laughs> even though you're undercover. <laughs> yeah, even though I was undercover. How do you manage that? How, well, how, how because, do you manage that situation then? Well, what, when he said he was para -reg? No, 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 when you get put in charge of the fucking up. Well... Does it become easier or harder for you to do 100% easier, oh. beca because what, what we've done is, is I can say, if they want to do some, like, robbery and hurt someone, I'll say no. This is what we can do. And by this time, we've uh, we've um, developed information about previous robberies. And so, as as an undercover police, you cannot incite counsel or procure someone to commit an offence or a, a, an offence of a more serious nature than they otherwise would have committed. So I, they were in a holding pattern with me. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, and it's quite strange because sometimes you can do an infiltration into an area and you get good people saying to you... Um, 
listen, I'm a bit skint at the minute. Uh, I believe you're, you know, you're, you're a drug dealer. Uh, can I work with you? And these are really, really good people. And you say, fuck off, you wanker. I don't even fucking know who you are now. Fuck off. And they go, well, there's no need to be like, yeah, fuck off. Or some landlord that takes a shine to you. You have to, you know, a good land, nice landlord, good person. You have to distance him. Because later on, whenever he gets arrested, they're going to go to that landlord and said, you said he was a good person. And this young kid that you fucked off, he's thanking his lucky stars because potentially he could have got enveloped in all this and gone to jail. So that's called collateral intrusion. So say, for example, you're, uh, uh, you own 10 shop premises and I come and hire one off you and you're telling everyone what a good fella I am and you've known me for years and I buy a load of go stolen goods from burglars. Then later on, when they all get arrested, then burglars might come back to you and say, you said he was a fucking good man. So what I would say is, do you know that Hugh has rent rented me this shop? What a cunt he is, I want fuck all to do with him. And then when you'd come in, and be nasty to you and you'd stay away from me. And then when the burglars get get grabbed, they'll say, fucking hell, what do you think about him? You and you went, he was, a, he was always a cunt to me, do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's to save you. Mm. So uh, I was doing a shop sting once. And uh, this guy said, uh, do you buy, uh, there's two little stories. Have we got time? Shall I tell you these two <laughs> little yeah, ones? crack on, mate. I mean, I, I'll tell you the kidnap one later if you want, but. So. Uh, oh, you're the kidnap one? <laughs> the one where you got a little bit kidnapped? Yeah, a tiny bit kidnapped. <laughs> yeah. So I'm doing a shop sting, and it, um, and people used to come in, and I had a, a plug on the top of the, of the, um, counter and I had a picture of Jennifer Ellison from um, Brookside this blonde haired girl she's real, really nice looking and the camera was um, was in the um, picture of Jennifer Ellison <clears throat> so whenever they used to come in he'd say has anyone seen me missus and I'd point to it and they'd look and go she's fitter and of course we get you know a good picture of him <laughs> so um, this this uh, this um, extension I'd put it on top of the of the uh, counter and when someone to come in with stolen tellies and dvds etc i'd plug it in and see if it was working you know because that's what you do as a second hand dealer um but after a while the, <coughs> the, the people who were coming in they were coming in time and time and time again and and we were running out of money you know to buy stolen goods so one day these uh these two and they must have been in 10 times or whatever uh, and we we were thinking we'd have to do a mini plan to take them out so anyway they come in with this uh uh, they rang me up and said, do you want to buy a telly? And I went, no, nah, no, nah, I'm all right. And he went, have a look at it. And I went, and if I go and leave the shop, I'm losing FaceTime with other burglars. So I said, you'll have to bring it in. And he said, it's a rear projection telly. Uh, so it's only a mile away. I went, look, I'm not coming. Anyway, so the two of them brought in these two drug abusers and it was the size of a fucking coffin. <laughs> it was fucking <laughs> massive. So I had a cutout switch, a foot switch for this. Um, uh, when I was bored, I fit a cutout <coughs> switch. So they come in and we plug this rear projection telly in and I turned it off on the floor. With your foot that they yeah. can't see, so, as if it's not working. Yeah, and I went, it's no good to me. And he went, fucking hell, it, it was working. It was working. And I went, it's no good to me, take it out. And he went, I thought, give us 200 quid. I went, I'll give you a tenner. <laughs> so they said, that plug's fucked. So I turned, I've got a fan and I plugged, the, you know, I plugged it in and I touched, put the foot button on and it was whizzing round. <laughs> <laughs> They, they changed the fucking fuse. They changed the fuse. Fucking hell. Everything. And I went, I'll give you a tenner. And in the end, we settled for £11. So I'll give me £11. Uh, and they fucked off. And then they had this massive telly. But then another one, someone said to me, he came in and said, uh, uh, do, you buy, do you buy, you know, electrics? I went, yeah, of course I do. He went, telly, vids, uh, DVD player, all that. I went, yeah, all right. He went, do you mind just coming with me and picking it up? And he was a new target, quite tasty. And we went from there <coughs> buying shit electrics to buying a kilo of cocaine because we we saturated the area with our love and we got referenced up by everyone. And in the end, we went, listen, we can help you out with drugs. So it's come from buying shit DVDs to buying a kilo of cocaine. So anyway, uh, I says to this, car, this, this guy, right, jump in the van. So we jumped in the van and he directs me, it's just here, will you just wait a minute? I went, yeah. So he said, you just turn the van down and I'll load the stuff in. I went, absolutely no problem. And I've got the eyeball on him, so I know where he's gone in. So in the mirror, I see him stepping back, lifting his foot up, and then he kicks a fucking front door in. He runs in, comes running out with a video and a, a DVD. Jumps in the back of the van, drive, drive! Fucking hell. So anyway, what can I do? 
So uh, drive down the road, went, you're a fucking wanker, get out of the car. And as he gets out of the car, he goes to leave the stuff. Uh, sorry, he goes to take the stuff. Went, fucking leave him, you cunt, put him in that position. Don't ever fucking do that again. So he goes off and I rang up my boss. A, an amazing man. Uh, I'll, call, I'll just call him Andy. Went, Andy, I think I've just been involved in a... Uh, a burglary. <laughs> he went, what the fuck? <laughs> and I went, I, I hope it's not an aggravated burglary, um, but I've definitely been involved in a burglary. So we had to have a chat with CPS, and of course, um, you know, it, there was a lot of to and fro I maintained my cover. There was no one in direct threat, and we could get the property back to him quite quick. So, um, so uh, the last boring story I'll tell you is a kidnap story. Uh, so I'm in a situation here now, and I'm cocky, because I'm the fucking king. I am the king of undercover in the Northwest. Um, all the tricky situations, <clears throat> I'm talking to lawyers, uh, you know, we're, we're examining case law. Uh, I've run about 10 courses now. Um, uh, don't let me forget, I want to talk about... about uh, I want to ask you about, about Shea. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so this is a situation. I'm on autopilot, and buying drugs is a piece of piss. Piece of piss. Because they're drug dealers, they want to sell it, and I want to buy it. Sometimes they say, well, the drugs, it's 23000 on a on a kilo, and I go, fuck off. I'm not fucking paying that. And then I ring the boss and went, ah, they've offered to supply it, and the boss has gone brilliant. I said, but I fucked him off. And the boss is going, you fucking done what? I went, he's going to come again. But if I accept that, that's I, I'd, I'd compromise myself, because my persona and my knowledge of drug, that's too much. He's selling me a pig in a poke. And every touch wood, it happened. Every time they come back and went, yeah, it's only 20. <clears throat> hang on, hang on. He's selling you a pig in a poke. Yeah, a pig in a poke. I've just, never heard that before in my life. A pig in a poke. Just means he's, he's fucking selling me a load of shit. Do you know what I mean? He's selling me. Selling you a pig in a poke. Yeah, he's selling me. He's, he's selling me. You know what it's like? It's like uh, this microphone. If you say to me, I'm a microphone technician, and I went, I'll sell you that for 100 quid, and you, you know it's only worth fucking 50, you're going to say, what are you on about, you fucking idiot? And if you buy it, I will know that you are not a fucking technician. <laughs> yeah, Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, uh, they come back and we agree a price and, and, and we buy it. And the other thing is that negates them saying, I only sold it him because he's my friend or I only sold it him. You know, it shows some, mm. it's a business transaction. So anyway, I'm on autopilot, uh, buying drugs, buying drugs. Quite a low level uh, deal. This, but he's a high target, he's a high level target, but it's a low level deal, it's early days. So he says to me, um, um, I'll meet you at such and such a place, uh, and I'll get that stuff to you because I'm out and about. It was only, I think it was an ounce of coke. I went, yeah, no problem. So my support is about 50 mile away because it's a bullshit fucking buy, do you know what I mean? Bread and milk, it's like buying bread and milk. So um, I goes to meet this fella, uh, and when I go to meet him, my comms go on my phone, I'm in a black spot. So he's in a, a white van in front of me and he motions me to follow him. So we're out in the countryside and as I'm following, Range Rover races behind me. So I'm fucking boxed in. I'm in a dead spot. Fucking hell. Ambush. I'm being fucking ambushed. So he stops at this track and he points, go down into a farm. So I've got him in front, just past the track, Range Rover behind me. So I drive down. I can't, I, I can't go up the banking. I go down, go past the farmhouse. It's a mobile home, static caravan at the bottom. So we pull over, and just as I get out, my phone starts to flicker in. But by this time, I'm out, and I'm in the fucking uh, the port cabin. So I'm feeling <coughs> this is fucking going wrong. So anyway, uh, as we go in, uh, there's, an, there's uh, one in the van, two in the Range Rover, and there's two in, the, uh, in this port cabin. So we go in, they start giving me the hardware, who are you, where are you from? Snatch my phone, start fucking ringing people on my phone, saying, with the police and we found this phone. But luckily, everyone in my phone was dirty, you know, a bad person. Um, and so there's a line of coke there, have this coke, have this coke, have this coke. I'm like, I'm having fuck all off you. So they're searching me and pulling my clothes about. So suspect you of being a cop, then? Maybe not a cop, maybe an informant, but mm. you're not right. You're fucking not right, you. You're fucking not right. Why did they think that then? Do you know Fuck any not, way? Well, yeah. le later on, this was how it was explained to me um, on, on the we're sorry uh, later on. So they're pulling me shit about um, going through my phone and everyone, and they start ringing people that they know. Other dealers in the phone 
he was saying, he's a fucking good lad. We fucking know who you are. We recognise your voice. He's a fucking good lad. You're not the fucking devil. We know, we, you know, we recognise who you are. So some of, two of them got two of the deals in my phone. They recognised the person speaking to him. I went, what the fuck's happening? So uh, after about 20 minutes, um, they went, look, really sorry. He says, um, but we've been, we've been hammered by, do you know what UCs are? And they went, no. And he went, we've been hammered by UCs in this area under cover of adults. We're really, really sorry. And uh, so I was like tucking my shirt in. Uh, and I went, you're a fucking shower of cunts. But I was shaking. Uh, but later on when I played the audio back, it sounds like I'm angry. But I was fucking shitting it. So they went, we're really sorry. I have the coke. And I went, I want fuck all off you. Um, I said, you're fucking doing all this? Having me over for fucking pennies? And he went, no, no. We just don't know who you are. I went, he's cunts. So I snatched the coke up on my way out. And I threw the money on the floor got in the car and drove off and as I drove off about five miles later I pulled over I rang my missus and I was fucking crying and I rang her on me job phone you know me dirty phone I went I fucking why the fuck am I doing this why the fuck am I doing this I was scared and I had not been scared for a long time um, and I thought that's me fucking done I'm not doing this shit no more so I drove handed me drugs over to me welfare and about an hour later I was all right do you know like when you have a close call when you're driving? You know what I mean? And then you say, I'm going to fucking, that's me, I'm always going to drive it, you know, sensibly in the future. And an hour later, you don't. Do you think that, do you think um, that, that like, that wanted to bin it off at that point? Do you think it's because it's a period of a false sense of security because you were so good 100%. at what you did? And so there was so, you were so good at what you did, so you, your near misses and scrapes are so few and far between and not serious. 100%. And so when it came, it fucking hit me hard. Shook, yeah. And it was like it was like the big fella upstairs saying, "You ain't as fucking smart as you think you are." And I went right, but I got my head on. But I'd been scared by it. Do you know what I mean? Really, really scared by it. How old were you? I don't know. As well, I was like in mid uh, middle, uh, sorry, early thirties. It's probably the only time that sort of the, even the Parareg thing didn't help me until later on, when Parareg kicked in and went. What's up with you, you fucking shit house? Stop fucking crying. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, later on, they, they come and see me, and they're quite sheepish, and they said, listen, we're really sorry, but this is the situation, right? You ain't got a bad word to say about anyone. You bought fucking loads and loads of drugs. You fucking don't take any drugs. You like a drink, but you fucking, you don't know jail. You're fucking too good to be true, you. And this is what I said, if you don't want to do any fucking business with me, don't do any fucking business with me. You fucking come to me. And he went, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's other things where someone said, you know, we want to search you. Um, and I've dropped my pants and my underpants, held my shirt up, bollocks hanging out, and go, go on then, cunt. And they've gone, no, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, it sounds a bit like a bit unprofessional but it isn't Hugh because it's all about you played a role understanding the mindset mm. and the response from these people um, so as I said um, about a hundred jobs sometimes just walk on you know to bring people stuff sometimes a shops thing that will go on forever sometimes coming as an advisor so I'll become a bit of a strategic advisor into people in, in, in jobs that are too hard to do then I came back uh, oh I got um, along the way I got I got a letter from fucking Tony Blair saying, do you want an OBE? Um, there was a couple of other letters along with it, and I thought... Oh, you, you get asked for that? Yeah, because yeah, um, some people... Uh, jo uh, John Lennon, I think, he either Binned said no to it, it or yeah. he gave it back. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so our, techni our technical lads are fucking brilliant. They can knock you up, senior Brecon, uh, pass certificates with distinction, anything, uh, anything. So I thought, fucking hell, this is bang on this. He thought they were yeah. Yeah. a joke. Yeah, thought it was a joke. So uh, I guess on, this was in the days of directory inquiries. Directory inquiries. Hello? Yeah, what's the name? Blair. Address. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> down. <laughs> Downing Street. And this person went, uh, like, obviously going, what a fucking nutter. So anyway, they connected me to this bloke. Uh, sorry, the switchboard. I went, who's in charge of medals switchboard here? Switchboard at Downing Street. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who's in charge of medals here? I mean, I got bounced around for a little bit. <laughs> Uh, and I had to say, uh, you know, I am such and such a police officer. So, the, you know, 
a sort of in, in my real name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people go, oh, right, well, anyway, I got bounced around, bounced around. And I, and I don't know how I did it, but I got to this office uh, and this uh, and this bloke, uh, when I said my me, me second name, he, he called me by my first name. And I went, ah. He went, listen, I uh, got a note from you today asking, do I know OBE? Is this a fucking wind-up or what? And he went, it would be in very bad taste. And he went, you don't know my pals. So he said, do you want it? And I went, yeah, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and so I got it. <laughs> Mega. What um, was it awarded for? Um, I think it's services to the community. Um, so anyway, so I did that. I had a fantastic time. Uh, the tr I loved the training. And my f to tell you the truth, it was hot. My face was burnt all over the country. And so I was concentrating more and more on training. And then that's when you mean, I thought... Sorry, you mean that it was a significant chance of compromise all over the country because you were just known? known yeah. To be well, yeah. As I said, I'd, I'd smashed it, Hugh. And... Uh, and the other thing now is there's there's a lot of benefit in going full time and I developed a mentorship program. I always encouraged it. So everyone who come, I always made sure they had a friend so they didn't be in the position I was in when I landed. Um, so I was really concentrating. Then then we had a breakaway unit, um, which is the test purchase unit. Those are the ones who were doing, I mean, brilliant young people, young cops. Uh, we in 1994, we set that up to train them so we weren't burning the faces of the uh, or compromising the faces of the level ones because level ones are doing the longer term deep infiltrations the level two test purchases they were going out and buying you know smaller amounts but still with some bottle now there's some people on these circuits who are saying i was a top level undercover me and they, and they weren't they went out and bought you know drugs they weren't full-time or even if they were full-time that night they were back home so they're they're, they're waltz but let me tell you, the ones I trained, fucking hell, Hugh, they were fucking good kids. They would deploy with some of the toughest, robust training ever. They would go into the lion's den and come out, and then three days later, they'd be back pushing a panda or whatever until the full-time test purchase unit formed. But, Hugh, they were fucking good, strong kids. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and I was so proud of them. But for the people who are saying they've done more, it breaks my heart. They should just be proud of what you've done. You know what? There's some cops, mate, who walk around their patch for 30 years. They're the fucking heroes. And I tell you who else is an hero. A young cop out and about on his own. There's a hole in a window or a hole in a wall or a door kicked in and that cop's walking into that. Mate, they're the fucking heroes. This undercover shit, mate, usually we had a plan. You know, we had resources. We had extraction plans. We, we'd think about actions on, you know what I mean? But these young kids now who are walking into these dangerous situations, these young cops, fucking hell, mate, they're fucking heroes. Do you get me? Mm. And, I, and again, stepping in as it's happening, not knowing what's going on. 100%. Yeah. Hugh, that's no bullshit false modesty. Them kids are now going into dangerous situations that, that 20 years ago were fucking one-offs. And it's daily occurrences now. So my fucking hat goes off to these people. What do you mean? Why is that? It, it's the, the, the use of... Uh, the, the use of firearms is going through the roof. Who would have ever thought one of ours would be blown up with a fucking hand grenade? Two of our two of our sisters blown up with an hand grenade. You know, it, it uh, the use of the internet is is allowing gang tensions to rise where we you know we can't see the visual um, uh, triggers that we used to see on the street. It's fucking crazy. The haves and have not people are getting involved in county lines, drug dealing. Not just to buy and you know, young kids getting involved in it. Not just to buy watches and phones, but to feed the families. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, it's a tough world. It's a tough world. How did you meet Shay? So um, I'm on one of these um, open days where a load of people come, uh, and it's it's more or less as it says in the book, mate. Uh, so it's I, an open day where you yeah. to coppers who want to know about yeah. the UC world, yeah. they can come along or hey, bring yeah. me up. Okay. And to a certain extent, I was coming away from front line and I was going into the, the training more and more. Um, so, but still doing a bit. Um, and so I'm looking around and, you know, some people look the part, some people sound the part. And I seen him stood on his own. I got alongside him. Uh, <coughs> he wasn't chit-chatting with people. And some of the, st the stuff other people were saying was ridiculous. I went, hey, he fucking looks the part, him. Because he looked like some people I'd put away recently. And they put away people with drugs and guns and, all, you know, all types. Um, so I marked his card, just marked his card. And then later on, uh, when we did the head-to-head -head, uh, about buying a watch, and again, I set this up to get a, a look at someone. You know, like um, you know, like if you were trialling someone for uh, uh, talent scouting for rugby, 
you're going to see him at a match, won't you? So I put him in the match, and the match was, he was up against me and my pal, who's another tricky fucker. Uh, and he did really well, and I went, I can see something in him. So by this time, I was the champ. I was the undefeated champ, especially in the Northwest. And when I saw the potential with him, there's two things I could have done. I could have fucking buried him, or... Because you didn't want a threat. Yeah. Or, like Angelo Dundee and fucking Gus D'Amato, when they saw Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson go, I am now going to become the world's best fucking trainer. And so I found him, and he was my prospects. And let me tell you about him, mate. Even my earliest in, uh, engagements with him up to now, people have always under underestimated him. I don't know if it's because it's appearance, he looks a bit tough, but let me assure you, he has got a mind like a fucking Swiss watch. Nothing gets past him, nothing. And every person that he sort of crossed him has really, really underestimated him. And let me tell you, none of them have got away fucking free. He is one bright fucking cookie. So when he was on the court, sorry, before he went on the course, I mentored him because I've got I've got fucking young Mike Tyson here now, and I mentored him. I didn't give him all the answers, and when on the on, when the course happened, I threw every fucking dirty trick at him. I was planting police fucking forms in his card in uh, before he was going out. After he checked it, but he fucking checked it again. Every role player I put into him, I said fucking give it this kid. And he went, do you not like him? And I went, no, I fucking love him. That's why you need to fucking give it him. Um, so they were saying, some of the role players were going, this is bordering on the unrealistic. He says, because we we, he keep, when he was in a, a, a situation where they were saying, you know, ridiculous things to him, he went, fuck you, I'm going. Now that showing maturity of an established undercover who can withdraw, give all the information to, to the boss and they can come out another way. But he maintained his cover. And I thought, fucking hell, I've got one here. So as I said, mine like a steel trap. So um, I developed in, developed in, and uh, there was a, 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 he came on the course, he pissed the course. We had, a, we had a drink at the end of it, and me and him fucked off for the pint. And I just said, look, I've got something in my head here now. It's sort of uh, been there for a while, and it's to take down all the, uh, the uh, toughest drug deals in my side. So uh, we didn't speak to more of it. Later on, I said to the bosses, because it being like uh, the training wing on my own, as it were, I speak to the bosses and went, let's get this kid in. Let's get this kid in, leave him with me for a couple of months, and I'll get him ring ready for the, for uh, for um, Moss Side. Now, when I was buying drugs in Moss Side, I lived even closer to fucking that than Shay did. I lived like a mile and a half away. But you know what? Fuck it. I was just going to buy drugs, you know what I mean? I wanted to do the job. On reflection, immature, maybe. Unprofessional, maybe. But I fucking did it. And I think he was like-minded. He wanted to get into the... He wanted to get into the war zone, you know what I mean? So, um, I, I helped him out. I had an idea of taking it over to, to Belfast and, and coming back um, and say, you know, that's where you can lose yourself. Uh, but you have to box very clever that people don't see this as intimidating you know so you can't associate yourself to any paramilitary group uh, and we went we learned you know we learned about explosive I taught him everything I knew well he knew most of it to tell you the truth uh, and he's my friend I speak to him every day I'm godfather to uh, one of his children um, and he's a you know he's a loyal friend and I encouraged him to write the book um, and I think the book's probably uh, the most realistic book about Undercover. It's a brilliant book. And also, it's a book to ask because, you know, there's, there's the, the stresses and the strains it puts on your family, which, you know, we won't go into. That's a private thing. If he wants to talk about that, he will. But he's a, a good friend. He's a, a mental health advocate. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to be associated. Uh, and when at the book launch, you know, he honoured me with, uh, you know, with some very kind words. So, um, so I finished. Uh, in undercover, it was starting to get a little bit health and safety-ish, do you know what I mean? It was different days from the craziness, you know, and the lawful audacity. So um, they, they had me in, um, a couple of them, and they were going on about, um, you know, you burn and potentially uh, we're going to put you in charge of admin now, you know, make me like a, like a colour sergeant, stores and stuff like that. <coughs> and I said, nah, that ain't for me. 
that that's not for me. I said, you, you're you not going to have anyone at the helm that's actually been live because none of the supervisors had been live in operations. So one of them said, uh, yeah, but I've, I've supervised, you know, I've, uh, you know, I've supervised hundreds. And I went, you've watched hundreds from the distance. I said, I watch casualty every fucking week, but you wouldn't want me taking your fucking appendix out, would you? <laughs> but my mistake was I shouldn't have said that in a in a big meeting because yeah. my card was marked there. Yeah. But luckily, because I had some goodwill um, with some senior officers I'd worked with in the past, um, I got a job myself with the uh, murder squad. So um, I altogether did three tours at, 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 um, at Omega. And I call it Omega because I love it. I, st I still call it Omega. Um, three tours. You had to get your head on straight to come back in again. Um, so I went to the murder squad. Then I went to the gang unit. Um, did a little bit in counterterrorism, and and I left happy. Um, unlike uh, unlike Shay, who was treated like a fucking not even like a dog, because in the police we treat our dogs well. Um, you know he he was treated very poorly. Um, but luckily when I left, I left with a bit of a smile on my face. Not so much for covert ops. I probably could have done another tour there. But it was all health and safety, working time directives. And unfortunately, the people now who are running covert training, you need to be having a drill down into their CVs in as much as what have they actually done. Um, but some very, very good people uh, still treading the boards. Very, uh, very brave undercover police officers. Very bla brave uh, test purchasers. Um and equally brave detectives, PCSOs, again, who don't get a shout. Um, the police, it's a tough job, mate. Yeah, especially now, I think, especially on that, on that, uh, you know, the, uh, what's the word, you know, just, um, just your standard police officers on the book, yeah. walking, um, walking the beat, you know, it's because of, Resources, the ch the constantly changing. Yeah. I mean, you know, but I did the constantly changing. Yeah, threats on the ground was the term, especially in the big cities. Fucking crazy, fucking crazy. Well, you know what? Some people say undercover. I'd be good at that. I'm good at acting. <laughs> well, firstly, it ain't about acting. You got to play yourself with a criminal slant because there's no second takes. And also, if you're with targets for weeks and weeks and weeks, you've got to remember the lie you told them. So being undercover is being yourself with a criminal slant. I mean, I bought a newsy once. Uh, am, I, am, I, am I fucking boring you now? Are we are we running over time? No, go for it. So someone... I some switched it off half hour ago. <laughs> 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 fucking you, you talk more than fucking me. <laughs> so uh, they, you sound brainy as fuck when you talk. <laughs> I sound like fucking... I've just been fucking I'm, released from I'm somewhere. I'm good at acting, mate. I'm good at acting. <laughs> oh, you could be a good UC. <laughs> so anyway... I had to go and buy this Uzi because the person who'd facilitated the purchase of this was another UC um, on a long-term infiltration. But that UC doesn't know the difference between a REAC and a DIAC. Do you know what I mean? A reactivated firearm and a DIAC and a real one, which for me is criminal, if you pardon the pun. Because if you're doing this job, if you're a fucking electrician, you should be able to know how to fucking wire a plug. Anyway, I digress. He had skills and specialisms in other, in other things. So... Um, so uh, I goes to buy this Uzi, and they, they say to me, uh, uh, Christy, do you, uh, do you know how to strip an Uzi down? I went, fucking hell, it's easy. You push the back bit, and basically, as long as the weapon's cocked, it'll fucking fall apart. And he went, all oh, right, can you can you show this fella how to do it? And I went, yeah, I can, but it's a waste of time, because he's, he, you know, it, it's not his thing. So anyway, so I went down to the armory, and there was a guy there called John Shepard who... who who I rang up, hey, can I have a dick around with an Uzi? He went, yeah, come down, come down, Christy. So strip it, assemble, and you know it's a piece of piss. So I go, and the um, my fellow UC is negotiating it, and we pay, uh, I think it's £1,100, and I'm going to pick it up. So I get into this car, and there's these two massive fellas in the car, one in the front, one in the back. So they give me the uh, Uzi in a bag, and I start opening it up, and they went, hey, what are you doing? I went, I'm make, making sure I'm not buying your favourite expression now, a pig in a poke, <laughs> which means a lump of shit. Because some of these deactivated weapons, if it's after the there's some legislation come out, it's more or less a fucking anvil, do you know what I mean? And and if it's before a certain Because the barrel's been filled yeah. and the, the, the working parts are solid and all that. Now, that's from uh, after this legislation, which is, I don't know, 2008 or whatever. And it might be earlier than that. 
and there's some that have been deactivated under uh, old legislation. So he's got working parts that move, etc. So anyway, so it's fucking pitch black, and I'm in this fucking car with these barmy fuckers. So I get out of the bag, and every time I'm lifting it up to get a look at it, I go and keep it down. So fucking hell, so I'm, I'm stripping it best I can. I've got a gold chain on, and I drop my gold chain through the barrel, you know, so so I can prove the barrels. And boom, I try to foul, uh, touch the ejector, the extractor, you know, and the firing pin. So in the end, and this is probably why they thought I was a bit insane. You know, if you handle weapons enough, you know, like, and it starts in the depot. You know, when you get that gun oil on your hands, and you you can and you put it in your mouth, you can taste it. Do you, do you know what I mean? <laughs> now, Hugh, tell me I'm not being fucking mentally. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, gun oil. You can. You know what gun oil is. You know. You, just, I'm I know, go saying, on, I'm keep, saying, keep burying yourself here in this conversation, go on. You I'm not saying I fucking drank it in the <laughs> depot, but what I'm saying is, you know, like, there's like that acrid taste, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I can't see, it's fucking pitch black. So I lick, I lick the fucking side of the Uzi. And these fuckers, and I try and do it surreptitiously. And one of them goes, uh, did you just fucking lick that gun? <laughs> and I went, yeah. So they're looking at me, uh, and I went... Get your man on the phone now. So their boss and my boss, you know, UC pal are together. And I hear him going, uh, so my pal goes, is it right? And he went, yeah, yeah, it tastes bang God. So this this guy who's with me goes, he's just fucking licked this Uzi, you know. And my pal goes, he always does shit like that. <laughs> and, I, and I said, Cause, because, mate, if I say it's right and it's wrong, my reputation's fucked. Do you know what I mean? But from what I could tell, it felt all right. When I licked it, it, it just, it reminded me... Of in the depot when every he gets oil to fuck. And the point being, if it wasn't a re if it was a deactivated weapon, it wouldn't yeah. have that gun oil on it. It wouldn't have that, well, that delicious, was delicious taste. You <laughs> delicious. fucking weirdo. You fucking weirdo. Fucking hell, mate! I honestly thought you was going to say, <laughs> Christy. I know exactly so, what you're saying. Everyone who's not power reg listening to this is going fucking reg blokes licking the weapon. Well, I didn't like <laughs> slurp it. What's I just next? Like... windows. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I did like fucking lick it up and down like a lolly. I just dabbed my tongue on it, you know, just like like a quick one, fucking hoping they lickers. wouldn't see. Fucking, fucking weapon did. lickers. Fucking weapon so lickers. anyway, so what happened then was they said, right, uh, the deal's on. So the money got paid to that boss and I was leaving and I went, where's the soldiers, which means bullets. And they went, do you think we're fucking giving you them bullets now when you've just fucking licked a gun? <laughs> and I went, well, why? I paid for them. He went, no. I went, I I'm not going to kill you or anything. And they went, oh my God, we didn't think you would, but we fucking think you might now because they thought it was a bit fucking crackers. So they drove down the road about 100 yards and they put the the, um, the magazines on the floor and fucked off. What was the word you used for bullets then? Soldiers. Soldiers, soldiers, yeah. soldiers. So uh, the magazines were the soldiers in. So, um, so that's about it. I think you fucking... I, I honestly thought I'd get a kindred spirit here now where you was going to say... Oh, you fucking know had it. me until you talked about licking weapons. Uh, no, I I'm on board. I, just I understand it. it. I, I understand just it. it with my tongue. It weren't like it. a sexual no, thing. You're talking about gun oil. I can see you salivating. So um, so what happened was uh, I finished in, in the, in the uh, cops and uh, along the way I got my fucking best missus in the world. Um, she's fucking amazing. Um... Loves me for for it. everything that's wrong with me and everything that's right with me. And I must admit, there's fucking, you know, that scale's a bit wonky at the minute. Uh, anyway. Does she like gun oil? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I said, I'm going to lick you like an Uzi. <laughs> no, I probably would never say that. But uh, hopefully one of, if any of your <laughs> listeners can drop that and then get, get the message yeah, back to you that yeah, you said yeah. to their partner, man or woman, I'm going to lick you like an Uzi. That would be great. <laughs> So anyway, um, what was I going to say? So um, so when I finished uh, in the police, I said to her, I'm going to be your PA now. I'm going to follow you round. I'm going to do everything you need because you've backed me. Because, mate, I've missed so many birthdays and Christmases and dinners. I've had recording devices, been kind of. Um, and when I was in the gang unit, I was in the gang unit uh, as well. I, I loved it. And um, I'll be straight with you. My family took uh, uh, second position. And and I, and I see that now. So I said to her, I'm going to be your PA. After about two weeks, she said, if you don't get a job, I'm going to kill you in your sleep. <laughs> so I got a job uh, working for an organization um, out in uh, um, America doing uh, doing um, co covert police 
advisory stuff. I, I won't go into that. There's no need. And then when I come back, I set myself up um, talking to people about gangs and drugs and keeping safe. And then I get out of the blue, I get a telephone call from a pal of mine, uh, a fantastic, probably one of the best trackers in the world. Uh, and his name's Bert Leak from Big Five Protection. Follow him, um, but not too close. He's a fantastic man. And he says, uh, do you want to come and, and do some work with me? Um, and so our idea is the the bush rangers in Africa, the ones that, um, his name's Simon Leak, but I call him Bert. It, the the moving from being soldiers to, to being um, more police, so uh, Simon teaches them all the um, all the like the military stuff, uh, X three para, uh, X two two, an amazing man, um, and I teach him the police stuff. So this the moving away from just being like a paramilitary organisation into being more and more towards police and law enforcement. So I'm doing that at the minute, and uh, uh, um, you know. I'm ble I am fucking blessed. I've got a missus who, despite my best efforts, still fucking loves me. I've got a daughter who's uh, going to university and, you know, and not just to fucking steal the lead off the roof. She's going as a student. <laughs> um, my dad's passed. I wish my dad could see uh, how I ended up because he always encouraged me to dream big. Uh, I speak to my mum every day and uh, I'm, I, I'm blessed that I've got, um, you know, uh, some friends I can call on um, 24-7 and of course Shay being one of them and um, moving forward he's going to get what he deserves I know this and also maybe some people who've done bad things or want bad things for him they'll fucking get what they deserve along the way and I think the best way he's going to do that is by making an absolute success of of, uh, of his book so uh, that's where I'm at mate and let me tell you there's no way I, uh, I would have done this. Um, you know, uh, I'm not selling a book. I'm not selling anything. Um, you're, you know, you're Pararedge. Uh, if I can help you and also promote my pal, I'm going to fucking do it because that's what pals do. No, I appreciate it, mate. Like I said, at the start of the podcast, it's fucking, I, I feel very privileged to have met you and met Shay. And um, just, mind this, have you in the network. Do you know what I mean? It's fucking mega. And uh, and you've got mate, you've got stories to tell, the experience and knowledge to share with people, and that's that's what the podcast is about: sharing that stuff, and people learn from it and be inspired from it, or learn how not to do stuff, how to do stuff. You know, um, they also learn that look, Uzi's taste good. Yeah, Uzi's taste good. Yeah. Well, you know yeah. what, mate? I think inspiring is a bit strong, but what I, what I would say is to motivate any, but to, not to inspire. I, I'm not that arrogant. But to motivate someone that if you think you can fucking do it, there's only one person stopping you, and, and a lot of times it's yourself. Um, and any younger soldier or pararedg guy coming out, if you think you haven't got skills or all you can do is get onto the circuit, that, you know, there's more... You, that, that, if you want to do that, that's great. But there's other things you can do. You can do what you fucking want. And pararedg is... Uh, and, and from what, what I've gathered about the other services... Is a good grounding for especially a young wayward, uh, you know, young man or woman. So, uh, so sort of my last word is, dream big, fucking treat people with dignity and kindness, and uh, be careful if you if you're licking fucking guns. That's it. We are. I have got two final questions Go from patrons that they they put in earlier specifically for you. Okay, so we'll finish off on these. This is from Al Al Rankin, who's. Um, Civ Pop, a big support of the military, a big support of the podcast, the patron. Uh, he's a jock, so we'll let that slide, right? right. From Al, uh, what took more nerves? What took more nerves? Fighting on, on Mount Longdon, uh, surrounded by your fellow paras, or being undercover on your own, surrounded by violent criminals? Uh, I won't say it was easy in 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 the uh, in the battle, um, but I was a young, as I explained to you, I was a young sprog straight out of depot. I had massive respect and trust for the people around me. And and there wasn't much thinking in it. And I don't mean to sound that like I was thick, but we needed to do that, and it got done, and everyone was pulling, and I was in a team. Being undercover, sometimes you can be on your own for, uh, you know, you, you touch in with... Back in my day, you, you might touch in with your support officer by phone once a day, and you might not see anyone who's not a criminal for two or three, two or three days on the bounce. So different challenges, really. Um, the threat of death 
um, an injury in, in the Falklands, obviously. But I didn't think of it, you know. I was with my pals, and we're all in the same boat. But being undercover, fuck me, sometimes you're on your own. Next question, last question. This is from a guy called Al Parker. Al Parker is X3 Pirate, mate. Oh, right. lives in Australia now. He may have bumped into him at some point, some, somewhere. I happened to bump into him in Arnhem uh, three or four years ago, and then we, we hit it off since, Now he's a supporter of the podcast. From Al, uh, do you feel what you were exposed to on Longdon helped equip you for the undercover work? 100%. Fucking million percent. Because them fuckers there that I went up against, they couldn't do... As as we as we touched on before, they could. They're not gonna kill me, you know. They're not gonna kill me. They might give me a beating, but so fucking what? Uh, and if they do decide to kill me, I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, but being in 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 the parachute regiment as a crow did prepare me for the physical conflict. Uh, I was a very young lad, and maybe if I would have had more to lose. It would have affected me more in the head, if you know what I mean. But I had nothing to lose. But parachute regiment and the army, you know, um, there can be some bad sides to it. And a lot of people are suffering from PTSD. And, and, and it's right that it be recognised. But if people like me join the army and we come out of it relatively unscathed physically and mentally, it just sets you up for life. You know, it just shit, it just 100% sets you up for life. And I'd highly recommend it for any young man or young woman who, who, who is a bit aimless and he wants some direction. I'd recommend it. Do two, three years. That's it. Quality. How can people follow you? What? How can people follow you? What are you doing? What? You're on uh, you're on Instagram. Oh, as... fucking hell. I thought you meant if I walked off now. <laughs> <laughs> right, how can you follow me? Yeah, a fucking distance. <laughs> The real Christy Vincent yeah, is on Instagram. Yeah. And I, I have to apologise. I don't know why I'm the real Christy Vincent, because I'm fucking not the real Christy Vincent, am I? But, um, yeah, real Christy Vincent, follow us. Um, but also, follow me pal, um, Shay Doyle. Uh, Big Five. Uh, and Big Five Protection. Oh, Shay. Forget yeah, Shay, Shay, of course, yeah. Follow, follow them. To tell you the truth, they've both got more interesting stuff than I put. I just usually fucking... Just take the piss and bounce off what uh, what Shay says. Yeah. The other thing is, is there's going to be people listening to this uh, podcast, mate. They'll know me. They'll, they'll because the information I give you. Do me a favour. Don't be putting it on fucking social media because whether you liked me or not. Oh, they know who you really are. Yeah. yeah we yeah, were. Yeah. We were. You know, we're part of the Airborne Brotherhood. So if you know me, and even if you don't like me, don't put my fucking name on there. Has that happened? Some people have had a bit of a fish. You know what I mean? Uh, right, let's not be fucking morons, people. So, yeah, this is Christy Vincent. The fucking name doesn't go anywhere. Let's screw in that. Yeah, I won't be happy either with that. You know what? Yeah, Some people just think they're being smart, but they're not. Yeah, we're, not whether you like me or not, um, you know, we're Airborne Brotherhood or we're soldiers uh, together or just fucking people together, like-minded people. And, and I would imagine people listening to your show. Uh, so if you know who I am or you know who she is, fucking keep it to yourself. You You know... You could find us. You don't have to be fucking Sherlock Holmes. But bottom line is, don't be a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> mate, it's been quality. I've really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Cheers for your time. And like I said, mate, you're welcoming you at any time you want to come in. We'll just no problem. shoot the shit. And, um, yeah, 40th anniversary. I know you're doing a parade tomorrow. Are you doing a parade tomorrow? No, um, I'm going, tomorrow? Uh, going to... I'm uh, doing some training for um, some, uh, some kids. Uh, but on Saturday, I'm just going to go down... There's a couple of people. Uh, I don't usually go. Occasionally, I stick me to the shop, to all the shop. But I'm going to shake hands. There's uh, the people who've, who've mentioned to, uh, mentioned before, the ones who've died. That, uh, some of their mums and dads are going to be there. Mm. And you know what? For some reason, it's like a salmon. You know, going back to where it was, it was spawned. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to see Mick Southall. I'm going to shake hands with them. And to tell you the truth, I'm probably that'll probably be me then. For I'm on a couple of these Parridge website i think i'm going to uh withdraw i think uh i think i'm going to go down show me respects and i think that'll be it but i don't know fuck it you'll see how it goes but i've got the breaking strain of a kick cat and if southall says let's get on the piss i'll, I'll probably go but i'm gonna yeah, i'm gonna try i know what you to. mean i swings around the road isn't it i, I the way i treat it is i don't try and commit myself to anything right in, i know what you mean in terms of even things like um even things like uh um, uh, Remembrance Sunday. Yeah. Because most of the time, I do not want to go. Yeah. Sometimes I do. 
and I'll just go right. How do I? What do I feel like going? And, yeah. and it's very, it's as you know, it's complex. Those feelings and reasons that go into yeah. whether you want to rock up, whether you don't. Even things like sometimes I'll go with stuff like this, and sometimes I'll go just in a suit, yeah. or I'll just go in fucking jeans and a fucking top. Sometimes I'll go beret, medals. Yeah. It all just varies. Mate, do whatever fucking feels right. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You're beholden to no one, you know, uh, and you, people pay their respects in their own different ways at different Definitely. times. So um, sweet, dude. Been a fucking pleasure. All right, okay. All good. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a Hey Chower patron? Hey Chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched. There are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the Hey Chower patrons. So before this podcast was recorded, I recorded an exclusive Q&A, a shorter interview structured around eight questions. All the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand, and that interview is online now for patrons. That happens every time. Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. And you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the H Hour Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron. Easy peasy. If you prefer to listen to your podcast normally, H Hour is also on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's on all of the podcast apps. And if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app, you can go to the, the H Hour website, charliechannel1.com, and you can actually play the podcast, video or audio, directly through the website, through your browser. Simples. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a supporter. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.